A Distinctive Style magazine has the pleasure of interviewing Nell Newman. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. So you have got quite an interesting story. One of the most interesting things, besides being the daughter of famous celebrities, is when you were studying in school, you got a degree in human ecology. What is human ecology? Human ecology has probably come, become a little bit more refined in its definition, but basically it's sort of an inter, interdisciplinary study that looks at how humans relate to their environment in terms of the, the social and the natural mission of you know, our place on the planet. And I went to College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor, Maine, graduating in 88, I think it was, and that was the only degree that was offered by College of the Atlantic. And uh, it fit me to a T, so I'm really glad I went there. It was a wonderful little tiny college. So I'm, I'm, really, I'm really glad that that's the spot I chose. Yeah, and, and how do you think that early interest in ecology and, and that kind of thing, how did that all get started for you? I grew up in Connecticut in Westport back when it was very rural, and basically my backyard was the wood and the river that ran through it, and we had a, a pack of dogs, and I ran around the woods and fished. And so I was a budding biologist at a young age. It was always, you know, being outdoors, and, and being immersed in nature was really the way I grew up. So that was the way, that, that was my education. My education process was living outside and observing nature and observing birds. And uh, one of the first things that I discovered at a young age, I was you know, fascinated by birds. I was a budding ornithologist and mesmerized by the fact that they could fly and I couldn't. And uh, I found it extremely frustrating and discovered that my favorite bird of prey, the peregrine falcon, was extinct east of the Mississippi. And that was, you know, I was probably about nine or ten. And, I, you know, I'd read about extinction because I'd read books on different species of animals that, you know, had gone extinct prior to my life. You know, the dodo bird and the passenger pigeon, we managed to eat them all. But this was unique in the fact that this was a, it was an effect of mankind on a, an animal in an, something I hadn't really explored before at age nine or ten, which was, you know, they'd gone extinct east of the Mississippi due to the use of a pesticide called DDT that was sprayed on plants to kill bugs and had worked its way up through the food chain. And uh, to me, that was really uh, a mystery, uh, you know, a mystery and, and a horrifying thought that there was, you know, something that we were spraying on our food that could kill off a, the fastest bird in the sky. So that was really how I that was really the how I was indoctrinated at a young age, and that was my early interest. Yeah, and and it you know obviously it's it stayed with you. And now now one of the books you wrote uh, is the Newman's Own uh, Organic Guide to the Good Life: Simple Measures That Benefit You and the Place You Live. And tell us a little about that book. And it, it says that, you know you've got practical advice uh, on how to live a more environmentally conscious life. And I'd, I'd love to hear some of that. This was sort of a joint effort between myself, my business partner, Pete, a wonderful editor who used to be at Random House, Mary Barr, and a, a, a group of us uh, who sat down and really tried to spell out the simple ways that you can make changes in your life. Because, you know, nobody's perfect, and it, it is overwhelming, and it's important to remember that every little thing that you do does have an effect. My mom really taught me that. So we just uh, decided to you know, put down some easy recommendations and some guidelines. It's it's a little old now. I think it came out in 2003. I mean, some of the information's dated. We'd love to do a new one. And uh, so, but it is still it's it's still sort of the the basis of how how does one make a change and it, you know what changes can you make that are worthwhile. So I I think it's still a good guide. And some of those changes. My overall perspective is really just being mindful about what your impact is, which is certainly what my human ecology degree was based on, you know, on a daily basis when you go through your life to really be mindful about what you buy, what it's wrapped in, you know, can you make that trip, you know, on your bicycle, you know, just all of those little things, you know, in, in, in our consumeristic world. How does one really make mindful choices about what you need on a daily basis? and um, whatever ways you can use to reduce, you know, your waste stream. So I think it, it's, it's more of a overall perspective than certainly specific examples. But, you know, overall, how can you reduce, how can you be mindful about your consumption? Because, you know, think about it. Think about what would happen if you didn't have a garbage can. 
you know, where would stuff go? Could you compost it? You know, can you can you compost your paper bags? I mean, it's more of a mental state than a you know than specific guidelines. Right, and it does. It starts with the individual and and uh, making the changes that you can make. And uh, we did find a quote that I just loved uh, in Success Magazine from you, and and you said, "I want our company to leave a legacy of learning to find the balance between what's good and what's good for you. What's good? Supporting local farmers, making purchases based on need versus want, voting with your dollars. These are big ideas. Starting companies, charitable giving, organic farming, help." In communities, but big ideas begin small. They start with an individual with a generous spirit and a willingness to care, something that anyone can cultivate. Just thought that was a great quote. <laughs> and thank you for reading it. Yeah, and your dad, uh, Paul Newman, started Newman's Organics. How did that all get started? You know, it, it was one of those funny things. You know, we used to. Dad always made his own salad dressing, and uh, that salad dressing was based on a recipe he got from um, a little restaurant in New York called Madame Romaine de Lyons, which unfortunately is no longer in existence, and she made a very assertive olive oil and red wine vinegar dressing, and he loved that dressing, and he made it for us, and he made it every night for dinner, and he used to give it away in wine bottles to friends at Christmas, and people got so you know enamored of it that they would, you know, bring their wine bottle back and want, want to get it refilled. And so it became sort of a running joke, could he, you know, we should really produce this. It would be less time-consuming to do it commercially. So he finally decided to look into it, and when he looked into it, he discovered, you know, it was a big, big ordeal. And I think the first person he talked to about it, a manufacturer, said, you know, the problem, Paul, is that celebrity products always fail. And he really took that as a, a challenge, and um, he found a manufacturer who would produce it. And then he found a, a, a grocery store chain, which at the time was, I think, one store, and that was Stu Leonard's in Connecticut um, in Westport. And Stu Leonard's agreed to take the whole first run of product, um, which was, I think, 30,000 cases. And the first year he had um, it sold like hotcakes, and the first year he had, had $850,000, and he decided that he was going to give it all away because he felt guilty sticking it in his pocket. And so that was really the, the way that Newman's Own started. And it also did not have, um, you know, he was a very humble man, and he didn't really care if anybody knew that he was going to give the money away. So it took a couple of years before he actually put anything on the label. And I used to chide him about it and say, you know, hey, you know, you'd sell more product if people knew that you gave the money away. Right. And um, he he grumbled about it, and he said, well, you know, that's not really the reason I'm doing it, and he had a, a bunch of excuses. And then the next year, in the smallest print on the bottle, it said, you know, all profits to charity. Wow. And, uh, so, yeah, that was that was the way it went. Right, right. Yeah, I remember I, it took me years to figure out that that was a, a donation. Yeah, I mean, it was. It really was a small part of what he thought was important. Right. I mean, he, you know, he just, he didn't, he, he didn't, he wasn't doing it for recognition. He was just doing it for all those right reasons, which is selflessly. Right, right. And how did your dad pick the charities? You know, I'm, I'm not sure how he did it in the early years. He wasn't really vocal about it with me, but he always had a, he always had um, a desire to help the, the underdogs. You know, he really wanted to help those who were not, you know, who had a tough time, small organizations who, you know, had a tough time raising money. And that was really what he liked funding. So that was sort of the genesis of how he got going. Right. And how, where do you think that developed from? You know, I'm not sure. You know, I think he always considered himself very lucky that he used to joke if, if you know, he'd been born in another country, what would have happened? He never would have had that career. You know, what if he used to joke if his eyes, if, his, if he'd been born with brown eyes, <laughs> you know, what would have happened? That's right. So... He, you know, he really felt that, you know, that he, he used to just say that it was all based on luck, that, you know, he was lucky. He was lucky to be born in the United States, and it was luck that led him to being a famous actor, and therefore he felt really driven to, to you know, to give something back. Right. True. And so I think that just was part of his DNA, really. 
Yeah, true, true humility. Now, when you saw how Newman's Own was was obviously going to be a success, and and you know something certainly with with a lot of heart involved, uh, were you did you get interested right away, or how did that all evolve? Um, I always had recommendations for him when they were coming up with when he was doing product formulation. You know, just because I was a family cook, so pop, my mom and dad taught me how to cook, and basically he always asked me about different ideas, and they're going to make a salsa. And, what do you think? So I was, you know, around for all the taste testing and just tried to help out however I could. And from there, the uh, second generation evolved, right? It was quite a quite a long time after they'd started. I think they started in 82, maybe, and we started in 93. So I basically just, I, you know, I was, I was fascinated by what, by what he was doing. And it just seemed like such a novel way to provide money for charity. And when I moved out to California after I graduated from College of the Atlantic, I was amazed to see how much organic was available in California compared to Maine. There wasn't really any organic in Maine, not that I could find, um, certainly not in the grocery store. And so I, I remember talking to Pop and saying, you know, there's, there's just amazing amount of organic produce out here. They had, they had a Wednesday market when I first arrived that probably had 30 farmers and, you know, 75% of it was organic. And, you know, Maine, that's really from one extreme to another. I mean, Maine has a short growing season and there's there's some interesting stuff grown there, but not a lot of it. And going to Central California in the middle of the salad belt was certainly a big contrast. So I was amazed. So I just became intrigued while I was trying to fundraise and be the executive director of this small nonprofit called the Ventana Wilderness Sanctuary and the Predatory Bird Research Group. I worked for both of them at one time or another that maybe there was a better way to do this to raise money. And maybe I should really, you know, try and find some, you know, some format like what Dad had, but do it a little differently, which I guess was sort of a triple bottom line concept, you know, support organic, uh, support the growth of organic agriculture, and at the same time, provide money for charity. So that was the, you know, and and supporting the environment. That was the basis of our early, our early thoughts on Newman's Own Organic. Right. And so did that start off a whole learning process for you as far as organics, or had you already had that kind of knowledge? Base. At the time, I knew a little bit. You know, I, I knew in theory what organic was. I didn't, I did, had no, absolutely no experience in the, in the world of organic food manufacturing. So it did require a big learning curve. And thankfully, my father thought that it was worthwhile. Um, you know, when you think about it, kind of a, that was a, it was a, a big gesture on his part to be so supportive. So he, you know, thank God he was, he, he was, he, he said, look, I'll pay you guys, my business partner, Peter Meehan and I, to go off and, and educate yourselves about this for one year. And the deal was he would pay each of us $15,000 and we would have to pay him back for all the startup costs. So basically, <laughs> he was floating us the money, really. Right. So we, we spent a, a year going around to the natural product shows and just trying to educate ourselves about the process, how things were done and different products and, you know, what were the trends. And it was it was uh, pretty successful. I mean, that's how we came up with the uh, idea for pretzels. Right. And, and it's wildly successful now. And, and uh, does a lot uh, a lot of the revenue go t- still go towards charities or have you we, structured We have that? a royalty that we pay um, that we pay to the foundation for the use of dad's name and image. Mm, okay. And that, that's been the, that's been like that since we became independent in 2000. So we're, we're very proud to be a part of, um, you know, the continuing philanthropy of the Newman's Own Foundation. Great. And I imagine you're all over the world at this point? No, actually. You know, it's, you know, we, we, we see, I, I know when I travel, I occasionally see products, like I see products in Mexico. I have no idea how they get there. We do have pro- some products. Newman's Own has products all over the world, but we really are try- still trying to saturate the United States. It's a lot harder to, you know, our products are more expensive because their organic ingredients are more expensive. So it's tougher to ship organic products, you know, internationally. It makes much more sense to make things like that when you're there. But the trend is certainly going towards organics, uh, at least in the United States. Yes. And now what is the difference between, say, like USDA organics and your local farm-grown organics? Well, you know, there 
There may be nothing, you know. There, I think it's under twenty or thirty thousand dollars. They don't have to if they only if they, they have a very small sales. They don't have to get certified. But you know, it's, it's no hormones, no antibiotics, no artificial fertilizers, no pesticides. That's the way things have to be grown for at least three years before they can be certified organic. That's the broad definition. Then, when you're processing a product, that definition is maintained all the way through the processing of a product into a cookie, say, or a piece of chocolate, and there can be no cross-contamination of a conventional product with an organic product. So all the way through the manufacturing, everything has to be kept separated. Everything has to be cleaned down in advance. There are very specific guidelines to how this can be made. It's not rocket science, really. It's basically the way, as I read in an ad just recently, you know, before 1945, everything was organic. Right. Yeah, that was my so, next. That was my next question. Now, do you ever envision a world where we're actually back to, you know, it's normal to have food that doesn't have pesticides in it and that kind of thing? I do imagine it. The biggest, I think, stumbling block is, and it it has been increasing. You know, but until there's equal funding for organic research as there is for conventional research, you know, equal funding over equal time. We'll, you know, we'll know what the broader, larger implications of organic agriculture is for the for the planet. You know, we can already see there. You know, there are certainly examples. You know, the Rodale Institute has been doing studies for 20 plus years on on the yields of organic versus conventional, and I think it it's been very profound. You know, basically when the soil is restored from a conventional state to a rich you know, full of nutrient state, they can get equal equal yield to conventional agriculture, and during times of drought, they actually get higher yield. So there are examples. Different crops certainly have uh, different rates of production, but, you know, it's basically giving farmers the tools to be able to to plant accordingly and see how this works for them. But, they, you know, conventional agriculture has got a lot more money in it than organic does. A lot of these issues boil down to the, the money factor. Absolutely. So basically, uh, if a product is labeled organic, you can pretty much be confident it's, it really is organic? I, I do, and I think that probably the bigger question is, if it's not labeled organic, what is it? Yeah. You know, I mean... Yeah. You know, basically these farmers, I was just at the um, ferry building on Saturday. We had last week had the Good Food Awards up here in San Francisco, which was started by Alice Waters. And this was their first first year. And it's looking at small producers who small producers all over the United States who produce sustainable product. They had charcuterie, chocolate, um, coffee, jams. I got to do the jam judging. What else? I think that was it. Cheeses. I think it, it was a wonderful, wonderful project to, to work on. It was just fascinating. And one of the farmers that I was talking to, who was a small farmer, was saying about how expensive it was to get certified for a small farmer. So, I mean, you know, when you look at the difference between organic and conventional, organic guys are trying to prove that they didn't put anything on their plant. You know, they're paying a lot of money to certify that they're doing it the old-fashioned way, which somehow seems ass backwards to me. It just does when you think about it. You know, they're they're the ones working hard to, you know, and it and it is more labor intensive. And people do it because they have a love of the land and they are trying to work in harmony with nature rather than against nature. And those are the people that are, you know, somehow it seems like the certification should be on the other foot. Right. We should be supplementing these folks for doing this, and we're not doing that, huh? No, not enough. And and so do a lot of people that grow locally produced, or are they actually organic, but they just haven't done the certification? Is that happening? Have you seen much of that? Absolutely. And you have to really talk to the farmers you're, you know, buying from at the farmer's market. A lot of local is. A lot of them are too small to get certified. And, and a lot of them, because of some of the issues we've just been discussing, they feel that it, you know, they're not going to get certified. They have an, you know, they have ethical rationale for why they're not doing it because they don't believe they have to. You know, they want, you know, they don't want to have to pay the extra money, and this is the way they've been doing it for generations, and therefore, so you see a lot of, you will see a lot of signs at a farmer's market, you know, that say, you know, sustainably grown, and it really, you know, you do have to ask and see how people really are growing things. But I mean, I think it that that's part that's part of the fun of going to a farmer's market. Just talk talking to farmers about how their food, you know, how do they grow their food? And what are some of the benefits of, of buying locally? I mean, the, the the best part is the money goes right to the the farmer. Um, you're supporting your local 
sustainable economies. You're not you're you've got a smaller food footprint, hopefully, if it really is truly local food. You know, it's fresher. I mean there's nothing like buying something that was picked that day. I mean you just don't find that in the store. I mean not very often. We're a little spoiled out here in California, but I tell you, when I go back, when I go back east, you know, it's it's a lot harder to, you know, all the all the lettuces from here. Right. Unfortunately, I don't know why they don't grow lettuce on the east coast, but very rarely do you find stuff that's grown locally, um, lettuce that's grown locally. Sometimes they're they're just sort of coming on with that now. Mm-hmm. So you know, there's there's so many reasons, but I, I find you know, giving my money directly to the farmer is very important, and buying things that are so fresh. I mean, it just makes such a difference to the taste and the, you know, the, the taste and the nutrition and the, and your local environment. That's what you're supporting. And the studies are pretty remarkable. I mean, the organic foods and the uh, foods grown in your own garden are so superior as far as uh, nutrition. You know, our, our food now that we get in our supermarkets that's shipped all over the, the planet, it's remarkable how much nutritional benefit it, it's has been lost. In, in the process of shipping. Right. I know. I, I think that that's true. And I think that, you know, it, it makes sense when you think about you think about how things are are grown, and if you if you're never putting back into the soil, if you're not if you're never adding you know true amendments to the soil, you're not adding compost, nutrients, you know you're not building your soil. But you look at you know conventional production, that's not how they do it. They're spraying chemicals on it, and that I don't know how anything thrives in that soil. And then well, what comes out of it? Right. You know, what kind of plants can you grow out of that? I mean, they they may have the proper nutrients that were put in, you know, in a in a mineral form, or but you know, it's it's not building the the soil and supporting all the microorganisms that normally help produce those nutrients for a plant. It's a very different form of production. And it seems seems to me that this is where our, our great health debate should start. We're we're debating, you know, what insurance should pay for what and what procedures should we do. But you've got to start at the foundation. You've got to start at what are you eating. It's really pretty simple in the long run. I mean, I know that this article I just read about the, I can't remember the numbers, is, uh, you know, 200 some odd chem- man-made chemicals that they tested for in pregnant mothers, uh, moms-to-be. And I think they found a hundred and some different types of chemicals in their bodies. You know, and the, the the chemical industry, you know, put out a statement saying that, you know, these were all very small quantities and none of them are known to cause any health, you know, have any health effects. And, you know, that, that may, to a, to, to a certain extent, I suppose that's true, but what really has not been looked at thoroughly is the synergistic effects of you know, what happens when you take 165 different man-made chemicals and combine it in, in a human body? Right. And where do those chemicals come from? Obviously, they come from the air. Um, they may come from your house if you're spraying things in your house, but they're probably largely coming through your food and or your water. So the synergistic effects are certainly unknown, and this seems to be, that statement seems to be a loophole as to, you know, well, you know, we know that these chemicals are safe in small doses. But I think you really have to look at the big picture. And the big picture is, is this a sustainable method of farming? And, you know, without really, there's not a tremendous indication at this point that things like genetic engineering, you know, we don't have any drought tolerance. We don't have any increased nutrition. All we really have at this point is cross-contamination to organic food crops. Right. And that is that certainly, and that which is against the regulations for the production of. Right now, is that a huge problem? It's a huge problem. Problem if you're an organic farmer and you're growing organic corn, and, and your neighbor's growing genetically engineered corn. I guess what I mean is, is is it happening really frequently, or it depends on you know the the. It really depends on there aren't that many genetically engineered crops that are being that have been released that are also grown organically. You know, that's where you have the the problem. There are a lot of battles going on right now with Center for Food Safety and the USDA over allowing genetically engineered crops to be planted without doing the um, proper environmental impact report. So in in the cases where that, you know, where, you know, you're growing, you know, you're growing beets and or you're growing chard and somebody next to you is growing, you know, uh, conventional, I mean, genetically engineered beet, there can be cross-contamination there. And it's really bad with corn, so it's it's very tough to to do organic corn, and that that certainly doesn't seem to be it's 
it you know it's not something it it's an unintended consequence but it's certainly not it's falling on the shoulders of the organic farmer. Now, I want to touch on a, this couple of groups also that you're involved in, I believe. Um, one is the Wholesome Wave Foundation. Yes. Yeah, what is that? Um, Wholesome Wave is a wonderful organization which has been really trying to look at uh, the issue of uh, nutrition and access to, to nutritious food. And so they've been doing a, a double double value um, food stamp program at farmers markets across the United States. I think they've done 30 to 40 states now in different, they work with a, a nonprofit arm in, in the state to help uh, get these programs out so that if you're on food stamps, you can double the value of your food stamps when you are actually at the farmer's market. And it promotes the usage of, of, of food stamps at farmers market. It's quite a quite a remarkable program. So and, and they've had tremendous success and growth in, in, in the use of food stamps at farmers markets due to this because people people do want to, you know, improve their their food consumption. And so this is one way to do it. And then the other one is uh, Allergy Kids. Allergy Kids was started by Robin O'Brien to really educate the public and moms about some of the effects of different allergens in foods and food contamination. You know, what's, what's in your food? Basically, the whole concept between organics and genetically engineered crops and really trying to look at the research behind how are these uh, food products, these engineered food products and man-made chemicals affecting children. She has a wonderful organization. Great. How can people find that? Yeah, both of them are uh, very good websites. Great. So just Google uh, Allergy Kids and Wholesome Weight mm-hmm. Foundation. If people want to find out more about uh, Newman's Own Organics, where can they go? Uh, we have a website also. It's newmansownorganics.com. So newmansownorganics.com. And can they uh, order uh, mail order too, or is it uh, mostly information? I think you can get it through Amazon. Great. So if they're... I mean, all, all natural food stores have, have our products, and you can find out what products are available by looking at our website. Great. At our website. And we also have, we usually do coupons um, on our website also. Great. So those people freezing in Maine right now can get a little yeah. comfort and order <laughs> exactly. some Newman's Own Organics. Feel exactly. a little better. Good. Okay. <laughs> so, Nell, what do you think are some of the gifts that your father, Paul Newman, and your mother, uh, Joanne Woodward, uh, gave to you? You're obviously an well, exceptional person and very involved, <laughs> and I'd love to hear your take on that. Well, I think I'm you know, first and foremost, they really taught me taught me a, a true love of food and interest in in you know food and family. You know, we we always ate family meals together. My um, my both my parents cooked, and Pop and I used to always go to the farm stand. Look, you know, Westport had had a little farm stand. Now they have a farmers market. That's which is a nice replacement for that. But my dad actually taught me how to pick fresh produce. You know, what does a ripe melon smell like? You know, how do you pick a good watermelon? What does it sound like? I mean, he was very involved in uh, in, our, in cooking in our family. And I think that was something that I really find very precious. And my mom was the same way. We had old apple trees in our backyard and that's where we got, you know, apples for pies and applesauce. And she let me get chickens and, you know, taught me how to garden. And it really was, you know, it, it really carried through through the rest of my life and, you know, gave me a tremendous interest in, in food and family, you know, over over my whole life. I learned a tremendous amount of, of, about food through them. And in terms of philanthropy, I mean, they were, they certainly taught through example. Um, they were both very generous and, and very humble about, you know, their lives and, and what they did with their lives. They were not very vocal about, you know, uh, you know as you know, they were not very vocal about what they did. But I think that they set a very good example. Yeah, I, I love that quote. I read a quote from your dad uh, that he had a dream that he went to some kind of awards or a speech, something he had to give. And they they said to him, you know, how dare you ride in on the coattails of your wife? <laughs> Had you heard that one? No, I uh, hadn't. That's great. It's really pretty, pretty charming. <laughs> That's funny. Now you also uh, had an acting career, right? You know, I I did two movies when I was little and one documentary. Uh, the documentary was called The Eagle and the Hawk. It was, um, I think, it was actually produced by Audubon. 
and it was a, a little movie about, a little documentary about my friend Morley Nelson, who was a World War II ski trooper and a falconer who taught me about falconry. Very instrumental in my education and basically trying to educate the public about shooting birds of prey or not shooting birds of prey. What was going on in, in uh, Idaho and across the West it was, it was very successful in um, reducing the amount of birds that were brought in shot. And the, uh, the other two were uh, the effect of gamma rays on man and the moon marigold. Uh, which was uh, a famous play that my dad made into a movie. And then the other one was Rachel, Rachel. Uh, bo both were directed by my father and my mother was in them. And uh, so that was my brief foray that ended at age 13. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. It just didn't click for you or? No. Nope. It didn't. I always wanted to be a biologist. Right. Right. <laughs> I had no interest in acting after that point. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. So you learned it really early, early on, it sounds like. <laughs> well, it was fun back then, you know, as, as a living, I don't think so. You know, if there's people out there listening that, you know, they're maybe struggling with their health or they're trying to figure out what to do uh, or, you know, just have questions about what they can do to, to make it uh, a better environment, what what would you say to them? Well, there's a tremendous amount. You know, there are a lot of people doing a lot of good work these days. I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting nonprofits, the ones you mentioned, uh, the ones the ones that I mentioned today. They're, you know, I think the most important thing people can do is educate themselves. Pick a topic that, that intrigues you and dive into it. I mean, that's what I did as a kid, and it, it really served me well. I mean, something that you're passionate about is something that you're willing to take the time at and time of, and learn about, and I think that that's probably the most important thing you can do is to educate yourself about the topics that you're interested in and see how you can make a change. Because as my mother said, every little bit counts. And I think that's the most important thing you can do. And that's great. And that, you know, just like you said in that quote, it, it does start with the individual and uh, a generous spirit, which you, you obviously uh, got from both of your parents. And just once again, we want to thank you so much, Nell, for joining us and look forward to seeing uh, what you're up to in the future. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.